Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the enolization of carbonyls, specifically paying attention to the role of the base in this process. So if we start with some sort of a carbonyl and we react it with the base, that base can come in and snatch one of the protons in the alpha position, giving us the corresponding enolate plus the conjugate acid. So from the acid-base perspective, in this reaction we have our acid on the left side, and we have the conjugate acid on the right side. The pKa for a typical carbonyl is going to be somewhere around the vicinity of 19, give or take. Now, when it comes to our base, well, that depends on the base and the conjugate acid that it makes. Typically, we are going to see several different bases, like hydroxide, ethoxide maybe, um, hydride is a very common base, and something like LDA. All these guys going to give us different conjugate acids with different pKa values. And that is extremely important because if we were to calculate the equilibrium constant of this acid-base reaction using our shortcut where the equilibrium constant is going to be the pKa value of the conjugate acid, which is going to be this species, minus pKa of the actual acid, which is our ketone, we are going to be able to estimate the equilibrium constant. And if I do my calculations here and you can of course double check that I did everything correctly, we can see that we get numbers from 10 to the negative power to 10 to the very large positive power. And this way we can break all of our bases into two major categories. We can have the weaker bases, which are going to get us the equilibrium constants with the negative powers, which means that the equilibrium is uh, favoring the starting materials. Or we can have strong bases that are going to be giving us equilibrium constants with huge numbers which will favor the formation of the corresponding enolates. So when we are using the weak bases, we are going to get something like 1% of our enolate, maybe even less than that. When we are using strong bases, we are going to get virtually 100% of our enolate and none of the starting material left. So the nature of your base is extremely important important when we are dealing with the analyzation and trying to figure out what state of equilibrium we are going to get for this reaction. However, the nature of our carbonyl needs to be taken into consideration as well. Because if we have beta dicarbonyls, well, these guys are fairly acidic on their own. The pKa of the position between the carbonyls ranges anywhere between 9 and 13, depending the exact nature of our dicarbonyls. So in this case, if I do uh, the reaction of enolization where my base, ethoxide in this case, comes in, snatches that proton off and gives me the corresponding enolate, the equilibrium constant in this case is actually going to be 10 to the third power, which is a fairly large number, which means that beta dicarbonyls, they will tend to give you the complete enolization, 100% enolization even in the presence of the weak bases, which, when we are looking at the normal carbonyls, it does not normally happen. But what happens if we have multiple analyzable positions? Up to this point, we saw examples where only one analyzable position was available to us. Now, how about the example like this? Here, I have two alpha positions. I have the alpha position on the right side, and we do have a proton over here, and we have an alpha position on the left side, and we do have proton here as well. If we are using some sort of a base to deprotonate this carbonyl, then we can easily make two different enolates. The left enolate, where the double bond is between the uh, carbons on the left side, which is the result of pulling off this proton, and the right one, where the double bond is on the right side, which is the result of pulling off this proton over here. Now, in this case, if we are using a weaker base, such as hydroxide or alkoxide of some sort, we remember that the equilibrium constant for this reaction is going to be fairly low, meaning that we are predominantly going to be seeing the ketone present in our solution. We are not going to have much of enolate. And since we have enolate and the starting material present in the solution at the same time, it means that the reaction is at the state of the equilibrium. And equilibrium always favors the formation of the more stable product. But that brings me to a question. When it comes to our enolates, which enolate is going to be more stable? So 
to assess the stability of the enolates, typically what we are going to do, we are going to look at the nature of our double bond. The more substituents we have sitting on that double bond, and of course, as always, we do not count hydrogens for anything. We are counting non-hydrogen substituents. So the more substituents we have, the more stable that corresponding enolate is going to be. So in the first case, on the left, my double bond in my enolate has four groups on it. The enolate on the right side has only two groups on it, two non-hydrons, because technically I have a couple of hydrons over here, but as I've mentioned a moment ago, we really don't care about those guys. So that means that the one on the left side is going to be what we typically refer to as the thermodynamic enolate or the more thermodynamically stable enolate. So whenever we are using the weaker bases, we are always going to be favoring the formation of this thermodynamic enolate over here. Now, what about the strong bases? How are we going to deal with those cases? So if we have something like sodium hydride, H- is an extremely powerful base. We are going to get 100% of our enolate and the equilibrium constant, I will remind you from the very first page that I had in this video today, the equilibrium constant there is 10 to the 16th or even larger. Well, in this case, the important thing to keep in mind that bases like sodium hydride, they are what we commonly call a slow acting base. So it is not going to snatch all the protons immediately right away just due to the nature of sodium hydride. Sodium hydride is the solid compound, it's an ionic compound, it doesn't dissolve in anything, so whenever we're trying to mix sodium hydride with any carbonyl, it's going to be done in the form of sort of like a suspension and the reaction can only happen on the surface of the granules of the sodium hydride, so the reaction is going to be fairly slow. And because this is a slow-acting base, it will allow for the thermodynamic enolate because we are constantly at the state of establishing our equilibrium. So whenever you have a powerful slow base, thermodynamic enolate, which is the more substituted one, is going to be our major product. Now, what if I use another strong base, something like LDA? I again going to get 100% of my enolate, but the difference here is that LDA is an extremely fast acting base. So, in this case, the addition order is going to matter, and it is going to matter a lot. Let me explain why the addition order matters. Let's say we have our carbonyl compound and we have molecules of the LDA. We can either have LDA coming over here and pulling off the uh, proton on the right, or we can have LDA coming from over here and pulling off proton from the left side of the molecule. However, due to the size of the LDA, this is a very bulky molecule, we are going to experience a lot of steric interactions on the left side of this molecule, which means that these steric interactions are going to increase our activation energy. The transition state for the left one is going to be much higher than the transition state for the right one, which means that the reaction is overall going to be much slower on the left side. And since, as I've mentioned, the LDA is a very fast-acting base, we are going to form what we refer in this case as the kinetic enolate, this guy that forms the fastest. But I've also mentioned that the addition order really matters here. Let's dive a little bit deeper into that. We can have two different ways how we can combine LDA with our ketone. The first one is going to be adding LDA to our ketone. That means that the ketone that we have over here is constantly going to be in excess. I'm going to represent that by saying that I have one equivalent of my ketone and 0.9 equivalent of LDA, so I have a little bit less LDA than it is ideal. In this case, since the reaction happens incredibly fast, I'm going to immediately form 0.9 equivalent of my kinetic enolate, but I will still have a little bit of my ketone left because the LDA is not in excess, the ketone in excess because we are adding LDA to ketone. Well, in this case, unfortunately, what we're going to see is that the enolate that we have just formed is also a base 
and that base can start interacting with an unreacted ketone. And as a result of this interaction is going to be the formation of the thermodynamic enolate and we still have a little bit of our starting material left. And because in this case we are essentially looking at the equilibrium process, we have an equilibrium over here, the equilibrium does typically favor the more thermodynamically stable uh, product, which in this case is going to be the thermodynamic enolate. So if we are adding LDA to a ketone, we are going to end up making thermodynamic enolate. However, if we have an opposite situation, if we are adding ketone to LDA and LDA is constantly going to be in a huge excess, I can represent that as having one equivalent of my uh, ketone and 1.1 equivalent of my LDA. Well, in this case, once the reaction uh, finishes, I have 100% of my kinetic enolate and I have excess of LDA on top of that, which means that we are not going to see any equilibrium happening here. We do not have any starting material to equilibrate, which means that if we are adding ketone to LDA and LDA is taking an excess, in this case, we are going to be predominantly making our kinetic enolate rather than thermodynamic one. So you can control which type of enolate you are going to make by choosing the base accordingly and by choosing the addition order correctly. So TLDR here is that if you want your thermodynamic enolate, you're either going to use weaker bases, which unfortunately going to give you only a small percent enolization, which may be sufficient for some reactions, but maybe not sufficient for other ones. If you want 100% enolization or close to that, you're going to use either the slow acting base like sodium hydride, or we are going to use LDA, which we are going to be adding to a ketone, and on paper we're typically going to represent that by saying 0.9 equivalent of LDA or something of that sort. And if you want to use the kinetic enolate, or if you want to create a kinetic enolate, you always need to be using excess of LDA, and addition order is going to be where adding ketone to LDA, or on paper we are going to signify it by saying we have a 1.1 equivalent of LDA or excess of LDA for the 100% analyzation and the formation of the kinetic enolate. So if you want to make a kinetic enolate, LDA or similar fast-acting bases is pretty much the only way to go. Now, some instructors and textbooks do not mention that you could form thermodynamic enolate using LDA. In this case, if your instructor only used LDA for the kinetic enolate, well, then your life is a little bit easier. But it is a good idea to keep in mind that LDA can indeed be used to make a thermodynamic enolate depending on how exactly you do your reaction. Now, one thing that I want to specifically point out is that when we have dicarbonyls, these guys are always going to give you the thermodynamic enolates. So, for instance, if I have a molecule like this, where I have two enolizable positions with vastly different pKa values, it doesn't matter which base you're using. When you have such a huge huge difference between the pKa values of your uh, alpha positions, the thermodynamic versus kinetic control is inapplicable. In this case, if you take this molecule and you react it with one equivalent of LDA, your product is going to be the product of the more acidic proton being removed and you're always going to be making your thermodynamic enolate and not the kinetic one. However, good news is that we can use double enolization. In this case, we are going to either use two equivalents of LDA or an equivalent of LDA and sodium hydride or something like that. Well, in that case, we are in fact going to make a double enolate. We are going to pull the alpha position hydrogen from between the carbonyls and the alpha position hydrogen from the other position, giving you the double enolate, which is going to be extremely useful for the process called Weiler alkylation, which is something that I am going to talk about in a different video. But for now, keep in mind that when it comes to your enolization, it is both the nature of the base that is extremely important, and it is also the nature of your carbonyl that is equally important. And of course, if you want to learn more about how the nature of the carbonyl affects the formation of the enolate, watch this video next, and I'll see you next time.